Hello and welcome to Center Ice Cardcast, your one-stop podcast shop for all things hockey cards. My name is Eric Andrews, also known in the hobby as Hammerhawks, and this time I am indeed joined by my co-host and fellow hobbyist Aaron Goldstein, better known as Crease Collector. I'm back. He's back. He has returned. Starting things off for the episode, I wanted to share really quickly about another big-time addition for my collection that I received today. And although it is nowhere near as substantial as the card I shared in the last episode, which by the way, be sure to check that out if you've not already, this is still an extremely meaningful pickup for myself, as this card has been at the top of my attainable want list for my Nicholas Jalmerson collection. And this is a card that I actually mentioned during our White Whale episode earlier this year. So just some context about the card. I've been trying to acquire one since the product released in 2014, and I actually passed on a couple copies of the card early on, shortly after release, that just went for too much in my opinion. They, you know, they were selling for pretty good money for, you know, what I thought, you know, the card should be worth, you know, so I just passed on them thinking, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll see one, you know, at a much more reasonable price in a few weeks, no big deal. Well, Of course, I hadn't seen one since. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I was getting to the point where I kind of thought I might, it might just always be on my want list. And, and that's that. But luckily enough, earlier this week, I was trying to get caught up on Hobby Insider a little bit and happened to come across a show and tell post that was showing off the results of a case break of 2013 14 Panini Dominion that was posted by the user Cruisin. And for whatever reason, I don't, you know, I don't know why, but as soon as I saw, you know, that there was a thread about a Panini Dominion case from 1314, something just told me it's going to be there. Like he pulled it, it's going to be there. And, you know, so I clicked it, open the post, scrolling through the results and then bam, there it is. Just like I had a feeling it somehow would be, there it was. So of course I immediately sent him a message and we were really pretty quickly able to get a deal done. And the card arrived today. Funny enough, I actually ended up picking it up myself at the post office. I had to drop something else off at the post office today. And I checked the tracking right before I got there. And it had arrived at the post office about a half an hour prior to that. So while I was there, I just asked if they would be able to to dig it out of the back of the post office and, and just give it to me on the spot. And you know, they were gracious enough to do that, luckily. So, you know, so I'm able to get it today and then share it with you guys as well and not have to wait a few weeks to share it whenever we record next. So, you know, enough building it up and just to share it with you now in case you guys, you know, don't remember it from the past episode. The card is a 2013-14 Panini Dominion engravatures numbered out of 15 of Nicholas Jalmerson. So, like I said, you know, I, I think... um even though the wait was extremely tough and and definitely long, I think my patience and my gut feeling on the value of the card did eventually pay off. You know, I got it for pretty much what I thought the card originally was worth. You know, and I think I generally have a pretty good sense of what cards are worth when I see them. And, uh, you know, even though it took, you know, six years or six and a half years to get it, I, you know, finally got it. And, Honestly, it's probably one of, if not my favorite card in my Jalmerson collection. It's just so cool that it commemorates him winning the Stanley Cup. And, you know, um, Aaron and I were talking about this, but they're back in that time, they were just such innovative cards, you know, to embed an etched piece of silver into a card to mimic the Stanley Cup was just something that really hadn't been done before. So, you know, just the fact that he has one of those cards and that I finally was able to get one, you know, and that just the fact, um, you know, you guys are seeing a scan of it right now, but it's just an amazing looking card. You know, the design is really clean and simple and just does a really nice job of commemorating the Stanley Cup victory, you know, and, and really highlighting that piece of etched silver. So just an amazing card. And I'm so glad that I was finally able to get it after all these years. And somewhat ironically, and of course, this is how it seemingly always goes, but like I just, you know, have said, I was looking for this card for six years and I finally got it earlier this week. And then of course, go figure a day or two later, another one pops up on eBay. However, luckily enough, this one uh, is grossly overpriced. Hopefully the, the owner isn't listening to this, but your price is way too high in case you are just so you know, and I would not have paid that much. But um, kind of just ironic that, 
you know, after literally not having even seen one in years that I acquire one and then see another one a day or two later. So yeah, just wanted to share that pickup with you guys. Cause like I said, that was my top want as far as attainable cards, meaning pretty much anything, not a one of one. That was my, really my main want for my Jalmerson collection. So to be able to, to finally land one after all this time was an amazing feeling. So changing gears a little bit, that's enough about my pickups and stuff. I know, you know, the last couple of weeks I've really focused on that to an extent, but changing gears into something, you know, in the hobby that, you know, pretty much is really just capturing the hobby as a whole right now is 2020, 21 upper deck series one. So Aaron, why don't you just take us through that a little bit before we bring on our guest? Yeah, 100%. We're just going to go over some smaller details about the product uh, because we will have Billy Celio on in just a moment. Just to further um, talk about the infamous uh, Upper Deck Series 1 product for 2021. Obviously, it's a big year for a number of reasons, and the hockey card market has not been shielded from that. Uh, So this being a very, very unique UD1 for uh, a number of reasons. But just in general for this product, um, the release date was November 18th. Uh, There's been a lot of talk about this release since then. Um, Many different configurations this year. We have Hobby Retail Blaster, Mega Blasters, um, your tins, bat packs, and binders. And the Hobby Boxes, um, this is really key, have jumped to around right now, uh, while we're recording to about 125 USD, which comes out to about 165 Canadian, or if not higher, depending on where you're sourcing out your boxes. But um, this originally started out at around 90 or 115 Canadian. So obviously the price jump is something we see um, pretty much every year for majority of the products out there, um, just sort of your supply and demand. And of course, with this year being, of course, the year of COVID, but also the year of sports cards going insane, uh, we no doubt kind of, Maybe we didn't see uh, the prices rise this much because, of course, there is still some wiggle room. But we did expect to see some, you know, price uh, change because of the year that uh, sports cards has become kind of like in the spotlight. And we've seen, of course, other sport collectors kind of jump into hockey. So we knew that this product would have, of course, the the excitement because of the anticipated Lafreniere Young Gun, but of course, just the hobby in general, just people wanting to get their hands on the newest um, Upper Deck product from 2021. So um, definitely get it before you can, because um, who knows what the pricing is going to look like in a couple of weeks, especially going to, you know, like into the holidays. So um, inside the product, just some of the staple content is, of course, the Young Guns, uh, the various parallels that exist, which is the exclusives out of 100, the high gloss and those clear cuts, uh, the UD canvas cards. And um, speaking of the UD canvas cards, there is also some variations to the canvas cards this year with some autographs number to the player's jersey number, which I didn't know were in there. Uh, we've had a couple, one or two in the past. Um, but again, just seeing those canvas autos this year again are just fantastic. I think that's a great new addition. Uh, but continuing on to the stuff that we all know and love, we also have the Upper Deck Game jerseys and, of course, the patch versions as well. Um, some unique cards that are returning are the Clear Cut Exclusives Parallels. Obviously, um, you know, for collectors out there who play or collect, that's definitely a parallel that um, you guys know and love. And, of course, the Day with the Cup Tribute inserts. This year was interesting because, obviously, they could not um, include the recent Stanley Cup champions because, of course, these product takes a long time, months to plan. And so we'll let Billy speak on those. But um, some of the new or different content that we're going to see in this year's release are the French parallels. And I just figured this out right before we came on, actually. They also included the, uh, within the French parallel, they included the exclusives and the high gloss parallels as well for the base cards. So that is one that flew under the radar um, for me and I'm sure a lot of other collectors. So if you're a player collector out there, definitely ask around for these, um, not only the French parallels, but also the French parallels in the exclusives and high gloss variations as well, because it's definitely one that's gonna sneak past a lot of people, I'm sure. Uh, some of the newer inserts that we're gonna uh, let Billy uh, speak on here shortly are the Dazzlers, the debut dates, 
the predominant and the NHL worldwide inserts. That's one thing about the NHL worldwide inserts is that, like, I love those cards. Uh, when I first saw them, um, they reminded me kind of of the uh, jambalayas. Um, not fully, because obviously th- those are more um, desirable, but just, you know, the whole die cut, you know, they're, they're very die cut in such a way that it makes the card really pop because it is such a unique shape. And of course, you know, players are representing their home countries on there. So it's definitely a cool set, uh, something that I I love to see and um, a smaller, you know, insert set. Um, But it's one that I really love to see and it's definitely going to be a hit with those set collectors. So, um, you know, we're just going to let Billy talk on that a little more. Joining us now to talk more about 2020-21 Upper Deck Series 1 is Upper Deck Product Manager Billy Celio. Billy, thank you so much for being willing to do this. We know there's been quite a ton of discussion about the product, so we appreciate you talking specifically with us about the product. It feels good to come back. You guys are always uh, a blast to talk to, that's for sure. Well, we appreciate you always being willing to come on and, and talk with bums like us, so <laughs> thanks. So I guess just starting out... Um, Maybe if you could just tell us about some of the best things that are in Upper Deck Series 1 this year and maybe what some of your personal favorites are within the product. No problem. Well, UD1 is what everybody's been waiting for. It's the new rookies. It's, it's everything that uh, you know, the hockey players like. It's, they got big hits. It's got, it's got your set collector. Uh, it's got everything. So you know, coming up with, with stuff for, for Upper Deck Series 1, there's, there's a lot of pressure because – People are expecting something nice. And uh, I think, you know, under the circumstances, I, I think our team did an amazing job putting out the best product uh, available for the consumer um, in collectability and set collecting in, in big hits and all that stuff. I, I think we, we still, you know, were able to accomplish all the goals that we try to set. Uh, you don't want to mess with Upper Deck Series 1 too much. Uh, you know, there's... There's a lot of people that are expecting certain things. You know, you're always, you, you want to get your six young guns per box. You know, you want to, you know, get your acetate per case, just little things like that. But, uh, you know, you do want to change some things up. Maybe something wasn't working before and uh, you want to maybe change that with something that you think might be even more appealing to the consumer. So one thing about UD1 is you come up with cool inserts. A lot of times you just keep them going. So stuff like, Day with the cup, it stays. So now you have a hit with day with the cup. Then you bring in something like uh, puck drops, and that kind of sticks around for a while. So now you have another kind of like rare hit. Then you bring in like Fanimation and, uh, you know, the clear cuts and, and stuff like that. And like you get more and more of these rare hits, and it, it keeps adding up, and it keeps making the product stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's why I think year after year, people will say this is a much stronger product than the year before. It's because we keep coming up with these. Uh, ideas and we still keep a lot of the old ones because people like them now finding room for all these cards on forms when you're building it and getting it to cost out is a little bit difficult but uh, it's definitely something that uh, it's fun one of the inserts I really like this year um, would probably be the the dazzlers you know and if, if you were to look at previous sets of upper deck series one you might notice that something like seeing stars or shooting stars or that insert, that insert's completely gone. Um, you know, it kind of got, it, I don't want to say it got stale, but it just kind of got to be one of those cards that people would kind of throw to the side. We tried to make them look nice and colorful and everything, add deco foil to it, but it just wasn't, uh, it just wasn't hitting the, hitting the, uh, the consumer where it needs to. So uh, we really, we really, uh, we, we put a little more money into it and uh, we, we created these Dazzler cards because, I'm kind of, uh, I, I kind of like entertainment and sports. And I, I, I remember that the whole, the Dazzler comic book and you see that kind of just like space kind of uh, vibe in the background and stuff. I'm like, let's make a car that's just like bright, shiny, just spacey looking out there kind of card. And man, it delivered. It, it's, it's bright when you see it, like you don't miss those cards in the pack. That's for sure. And uh, you know, you've got your blue versions, your pink versions. And I didn't want to split it up like left wing, right wing, center, kind of like we did with, with things. So, uh, you know, parallels seem to be a big, uh, a pop color parallels seem to be very popular right now. So we gave, you know, some of the retail SKUs their own color, you know, different colors. You'll see 
Uh, I believe you'll see green out there and you'll see orange. So there's, there's a few other colors out there for you to collect also, kind of get a rainbow of Dazzler cards. But for new content, that's one of the, the ones that really, uh, no pun intended, pop out in my head uh, as, as one that I like. That's awesome. Like, I personally really love those parallels. I haven't really gotten a good look myself, but as soon as I saw, you know, the first couple of box breaks of this product, those Dazzler cars really, really popped. I had to kind of stop and kind of, you know, really look at those cards and think like, those are awesome. Like, what are those? So those really are going to be, I think, a hit with collectors and um, definitely, you know, a, a big addition to uh, Upper Deck Series 1. And speaking of uh, new cards, the French Parallels, made a return this year for the first time after 10 years. Um, what went into the decision to bring back those French parallels? Well, a, a, n a, number, of, a number of things. Um, one, we're, we're always looking for new content. And um, I'll give credit where credit's due. You know, a lot of people don't necessarily think that the, the higher-ups have much to do with making the cards or decision-making process or anything like that. The decision to put the, the French parallels was actually um, a decision that our president made. He came up with that idea. You know, he's a former brand manager. He used to help build products and stuff. So, you know, he's, he's very attentive when it comes to uh, the products that we build. And, uh, and Jason, Jason came down and we were, we we're all just kind of brainstorming and, and that was his idea. And you know what, what a great idea when you have a French Canadian number one pick uh, you know, kind of adds maybe a little bit of value to to that card. If you haven't noticed, those cards are now selling bet anywhere between one and three thousand dollars, from what I've seen from early sales. But as I said, it's it's another uh, it's another kind of thing. And and I'll give away one of the secrets. It's it's I've I've told people this a few people this already. It was it was supposed to be an Easter egg actually. Um, yours truly messed up on his paperwork, and it got out in solicitation. And so that was going to be one of the big Easter eggs too, was the French parallel. So, you know what, I, sometimes if you leave stuff as Easter eggs, it's like a surprise, but you know what, I think with, with Lafayette being the number one pick uh, and his popularity, I think maybe letting that get out on accident might've been a good decision anyway, because there was a lot of hype. Like people started talking about those French variations, obviously before the product came out. Um, you know, and people remember it happened 10 years ago. I still have, I own personally a couple of the old uh, PK Subban uh, young guns, but that was like a set I think they built in Canada. Um, I remember collecting, and this is a long time ago, uh, you know, they, I remember they had the, the French version of like the, the, the first series. I've got the, uh, the Yamir Yager, you know, French parallel and stuff. So it's nothing new. Like we didn't, we didn't come up with something completely new. But we did decide to revisit something, and we think we did it at a good time, and uh, I think it's it's gone over well with the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. In terms of something going over really well with the consumer, um, you know, one thing that stands out to me personally is the massive hit of the Nicholas Jalmerson Signature Sensations card, uh, which is his first ever autograph card. So even though no one else listening to this podcast gives any cares about that card, what can you tell me about that and how that card came to be? Uh, next question, please. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, um, we have, we have uh, inventory for, for, uh, for labels and stuff like that, for autographs. And then we have deals that we try to get with guys. And it, it's just a matter of our, our uh, talent acquisition crew is constantly just trying to get names um, our, our coordinators are constantly trying to put new names in products. You don't want to put the same guys in year after year after year of, you know, signature sensations. It gets kind of old. So they, they do a good, a good job of trying to stay away from, you know, repeating, heavily repeating names. And, uh, sometimes it's depends on what deals we have and, and what we have in inventory, uh, where guys get cards like that. And, uh, I know there's there's one happy person on this podcast that uh, that's happy that that we do that right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I'm going pretty wild. I've I've bought seven of them so far. <laughs> seven? <Jeez>. Seven. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, 
moving away from Eric's, you know, amazing signature sensations card that he's probably going to end up with like a hundred of them. Another cool card that the people have been, I guess, having like a love hate relationship with is the portraits inserts. Uh, they've always drawn a lot of attention uh, for their kind of unique designs. And for this year, um, what was the inspiration for um, the set this year? And what was the thought process behind these portrait cards? When I first started, when I first took over um, Upper Deck Series One, and I had a little help my first year because I was I was just learning. But it was it was McDavid's rookie year, fifteen sixteen. Uh, we were we were making portraits, and then we made them again, and they were just and every like each year, it kind of we would get the feedback like, hey, you know, these are getting kind of boring. Like people are just throwing them to the side. Yes, we like the numbered parallels, but it, it's just. Uh, it's just fillered, like nobody wants these cards. And so, you know, the name of the insert is portraits. So there's more than just one kind of portrait. You know, you, I remember all these school pictures that I had when I was a kid. And last year, and I think we had this conversation last year, we had our, our wonderful stepbrother portrait card where it has like one head and another head uh, kind of floating in the background. I thought they looked great. Some people loved them. Some people hated them. But people were talking about them. Now, if you if you look up like port, like school pictures and portraits and stuff online, I guarantee you one of these laser beam, you know, background '90s, early 2000 backgrounds is going to pop up on your on your uh, Google search uh, of portraits. It's just it's an era that some people had to live through. And uh, as I said, some people will think it's it's awesome. I mean, I've seen some of the pictures that they put on those cards, the Austin Matthews and the Connor McDavid. They almost scare me, but they I, I just I find I don't want to say I find humor in it, but I, I love the cards. I just think these are great. It reminds me of of these these uh, these school pictures or these photo shoots and stuff that people used to do. So we're having a little bit of fun. Look. There's, uh, you know, 15, I'd say, different inserts in Upper Deck Series 1. You're not going to like them all. Uh, we're, we're trying to appease as many people as we can with as many designs as we can. But, you know, you got to have a little bit of fun, too. And, and we've kind of taken portraits in the direction of let's, let's have some fun. And I, I think it's been very successful. People are talking about it. And like I said, some people love them, some people hate them. Uh, I think they're doing a little bit better than my Thermal Threats cards that I built in uh, <laughs> in full force quite a few years ago. Uh, but that, that's just my thought on it. Hey guys, like don't take this don't take this hobby too seriously. Have some fun, and that's what those cards are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it does a, a good job of accomplishing that mentality. You know, and I've seen some people talking about them on, on social media and online. And I know that we had talked about this earlier this summer, actually. What was the, the exact inspiration for that design? Because I know you, you had mentioned to me that that design very specifically came from... Specific it's already... It, you, people already said it, but you got Saved by the Bell. That, that's like the... That is the quintessential, like, Saved by the Bell type looking card. You know, you, you've got all those colors on top of the car. It's not just like the laser beams, but look at the call outs. Look at the, you know, the deco foils and stuff like that. It's not just your regular blue card with a close up image of the player uh, with a, a frame deco foil. It's, it's out there. It's got, you know, it's got colors. You know, we, we added a little color to upper deck this year, just with the dazzlers and with the uh, portrait cards. Yeah, for sure. And then, of course, you know, what people have been wanting to hear, um, getting to the obvious question, maybe just walk us through the Alexi Lafreniere Young Gun, what went into the various components and decisions with that, such as including him in Upper Deck Series 1 at all, giving him that Young Gun, the photo that was used, the timeline of producing the card, just a bunch of things like that in relation to the Lafreniere Young Gun. Now, I'm not going to be able to give you all the juicy information because a lot of the decisions were actually uh, more of our higher ups. What I can tell you and where I can tell you this, you know, all started is obviously we knew there was going to be some sort of, some sort of delay to the season. Uh, it, it was quite obvious. And, you know, we're sitting here on upper deck series one. Do we delay it? Do we, you know, 
Uh, does it come out when it's supposed to come out? You know, what do we do? And there was a lot of back and forth, and a lot of questions. And, um, you know, it, there was a uh, requested and uh, thankfully were, were granted the ability to use what, uh, what we call the bubble players. And what those guys were, were the players that uh, didn't necessarily skate. They could be dressed up in the stands, but they're like the emergency players that uh, were there uh, for each team. Uh, which we were able to get some some quality rookies from that group of people. And then, uh, you know, the request for Alexi uh, came up and uh, they were nice enough to grant us uh, to be able to use Alexi. So uh, once we found out that we could use Alexi, um, then, you know, we kind of had to figure some other things out. Again, we're still trying to figure out when the product's going to come out. Now, here's one thing that people really haven't thought of that much when they're thinking about this whole timeline. Not only are we making the cards and we're making the cards for a certain period of time, but we have our, you know, our manufacturers that are printing these cards. So they were hit, like, we're not the only ones that, I've been working from home for the past six, seven months, however long it is, but we're not the only ones that were hit with, with uh, restrictions on COVID. Some of some of these guys that are printing our cards were also hit, which means that they had to limit the amount of people that could be in the buildings at times. Uh, sometimes they even had to shut down completely. So basically what happened now, we're not the only people they print for either. There's multiple people they print for. So what happens is when they get things back and running, there's a calendar and they need to fill their calendar in certain times and certain spots. And, you know, if we lost that spot of when we were printing Upper Deck Series 1, who knows when we would have been able to, to regain that spot because there's so many other things that need to get printed. So that kind of helps our decision-making process of, okay, well, when is this product going to come out? Well, this is the time frame that we're given to, to get this product out. So we've done that. Um, now who's going to take, I mean, it was pretty well known that, uh, that he'd be number one, but we had to wait forever for the draft to happen. So we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. It didn't help that the wild card spot got the number one pick because we were ready to go. And then all of a sudden, great, we got to wait again. And so we waited and waited and waited for that. Then he's finally picked. So then we're just, you know, trying to, to figure out what, we, what to do. And again, this is kind of, this is above my, my pay rate on what I do for the company. But obviously we... We scheduled a, a, a skating session or a photo shoot session with him. I'm not exactly sure, you know, how much time or whatnot, but this was before he picked his number. I know that was a big question too, is why isn't his number there? It's, well, he didn't have a number yet. Uh, his number that he used was Mark Messier's number. So we knew it was going to change. We just didn't know what it was going to be. So um, we really couldn't put any numbers or anything like that on that. So. We, we, we did our best we, with the time constraints. And the other thing that people don't understand is just like, well, why didn't you just wait? Well, it takes time to print cards, you know? And then once it takes time to, you know, it, we have to give them all these, these files and stuff, and then they have to print the cards. Well, it takes time. It takes time to cut the cards. It takes time to put little jersey swatches in the jerseys. So this isn't like a, like, here's all of our stuff. Overnight, they print it all, and the next day, they put it all in boxes. This takes weeks, if not a month, to get all this stuff accomplished. So, you know, there's, there's a big time frame. And, you know, as I said, I, I honestly feel we did more than expected for what we were given uh, for the Alexi card. You know, people like, oh, well, he's just standing there with the picture. You know, I, don't, I, I wasn't in the decision-making process of, of choosing which image to use. But, uh, again, just to be able to get that photo shoot with him, wearing a Rangers jersey. That was an accomplishment itself that, you know, I got to give kudos to, to our, our team on that. Um, if you don't like the picture, I'm, I'm sorry. Some people don't have a problem with it. People are just kind of stuck with, like, traditionally what they think and what they see. And for the last number of years, most of the uh, young guns have been pictures of the guys skating on the ice, you know, during a game. So that's what they're expecting to see. You know, we weren't able to do that because – Obviously, he's never skated a game in the NHL, so we did what we could with what we had. And I will say one other thing, not necessarily about Lafreniere, but, you know, a lot of people are opening up Upper Deck Series 1, and they're just like, well, it's Lafreniere or, or bust. 
And what people don't understand is, man, I would be swiping up as many of these young, other young guns as you can right now. Because what it is, is the guys that are in this set, a lot of them would be starting off with the team. These bubble guys would probably be coming up and being on the team. And then you would already know who they are. You know, oh yeah, so-and-so made the team. I got to get this. He's the new, you know, defenseman on the uh, Maple Leafs and blah, blah, blah. But because they haven't been given the chance to skate first and then Upper Deck Series 1 comes out, um, everyone's just like, I don't know who this is. I'm telling you right now, if the season would have started before in the training camps and all that stuff, you got a lot of sleepers sitting in on you in series one right now that people just have no clue about. And if I were a buyer right now, um, I would be picking up a bunch. I'm surprised I haven't already gone on, on uh, eBay and bought myself a bunch of Lidstrom uh, young guns. Cause uh, you know, that's a guy I think for the Red Wings, you know, he played a little bit last year, but I, I think he's going to, he'll get called up again. I think he'll be a part of that, uh, of the new dynasty of Detroit. No, <laughs> we got to wait. <laughs> That's just something about uh, that UD one that I, I think is being overlooked right now, but that's something for you guys to find out, I guess. Absolutely. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So obviously like just hearing your rundown of what went into the product, um, the product as a whole was done in a unique way uh, from ways that you touched on, from ways that you, you probably can't. But given the circumstances, um, what was it like for you and your team just putting this together? Like, I'm sure there was a lot of frustrating moments for sure. But just, again, like, like as a whole, would you say it was a positive experience putting this product together from start to finish with your team? It was a learning experience. Learning you know, experience. Um, you, you deal with circumstances and there's – Plenty of different circumstances. When you have a good rookie class, when you have a bad rookie class, when you have a surprisingly good rookie class, you know, that uh, you, you learn. And uh, we got put in situations that guys that have been there for 10, 15, 20 years, you know, yeah, we've dealt with a strike before, but uh, this, this was something completely different. This is something that, you know, we, we, know, we know there's going to be a season, but what's going to happen? You know, we, we had to sit there and say, are, do we have 50 rook Like, before we got all the bubble rookies and Alexi, we had to sit there and, like, do we have enough rookies to make 49 young guns? That was, that was an honest question that we had to sit there and, and, and our, our coordinators, you know, were doing some research. And, you know, there's, there's some guys in there that, uh, you know, luckily we, we found a couple. There's, there's still some that we didn't use. but we ended up with, with enough, obviously, but, uh, you know, something like that. I've never been in that situation where we had to wonder if we had enough rookies for, for upper deck series one, you know, that's usually a no brainer. And, and it's not just series one. It's, you know, we've got other products coming out that, you know, we have to figure out how are we going to put the new rookies into the set? It's definitely a challenge, but with, with UD one, you know, there's, there's inserts and stuff like that, that, uh, may usually have more rookie content, but we just didn't have enough rookies out there to, to do it. Everything else is, you know, you know the other guys are going to be skating. You know, you know, you have UD game jerseys. So those, that's another thing is, you know, jerseys, how many jerseys do we have? When are we going to get them? When are we going to get jerseys in? Stuff like that to, to put in these cards because these guys are on lockdown. What people understand is like it's not like we could go into the bubble and get autographs from all these guys. It's not like we could go in the bubble and get jerseys from all these guys. These are some of the um, challenges that that we've seen in UD1 and other sets that we've built at the beginning of the year. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure, and I think that's something that you know people really need to keep in mind. Um, you know, not only just for Upper Deck One, but for other products moving forward, like you've said. I think that's pretty much all the questions we have about Upper Deck 1. Is there anything else that you would want to add about the product? One thing I will mention, a lot of people have been kind of shocked at, the, at some of the prices that, some, that like Lafayette has been going for. Like They're like, how can Lafayette's rookie card, who hasn't skated a game, sell for more than McDavid's did, for more than so and, and you know, Matthews did, for more than uh, McKinnon did? To those people, I really would say, take a look at the card market right now. Hockey has been one of those sports that it's been a lot more consistent than, than some of the other sports that have just skyrocketed. But that's not to say that people still aren't coming in from other sports looking for 
for big investments for big for big rookies. And I think you're seeing that with the Lafreniere that these investors that are investing, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on other sports cards are starting to come into the hockey market. And uh, you know, you've got a big name like Alexi. They're they're looking to invest in them. How many bounties did like I saw? What was there like four different bounties on the high gloss uh, on the high gloss Lafreniere, ranging from ten thousand to thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. I'm I'm happy that uh, hockey is still uh, an affordable product that people like your kids can collect and whatnot. But for people to think it's crazy that these prices are going up on some of these cards, I, I would just I would just say look at the card market right now. That's that's the trend. That's that's what's happening, and it's not, not happening as 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 often and as high as it is uh, in hockey, but uh, it's it's going to happen a little bit. So you know, keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. And I just had one other question that came in my mind. Um, you know, and, and I know you might not be able to answer, might not want to answer. If you do, it can just be a, a yes or no. There's been a lot of discussion online about oh, like this isn't really a rookie card because he hasn't played yet. So they're going to do an update in series two. So for those people wondering, will there be an updated version of the Lafreniere Young Gun? There will be no updated Lafreniere Young Gun in series two. So don't worry about that. Um, There you you have it. (laughs) We thought it would be okay to put his Young Gun canvas in UD1 because as you know, he's from Canada. So we also have a program of excellence. So there's a chance that he'll be uh, in that set, I can't say yes or no, but if, uh, you know, if you were a guessing man, you probably would think that'd be an appropriate place to, to put him in canvas for series two, but he will not have an, uh, a young gun in series two. And then changing gears a little bit, we, we heard that there was a big announcement that you guys made at the fall expo. What can you tell us about that? You know, a lot of people have been asking for the set for quite some time. And uh, we, we've been talking about it for quite some time. And uh, it's been the works. Uh, I actually built it. It was a lot of fun. But uh, as, uh, as we stated at the, uh, at the virtual expo this year, we will have 2020-2021 Metal Universe Hockey coming out. So uh, Get ready for those PMGs. Get ready for those jambalayas, platinum portraits, all those cards that uh, you guys love. You know, they're, they're coming back, and they're coming back hard. Let me just put it that way. The set is gorgeous. Um, our design team did an amazing job. Uh, we wanted to do this right. We didn't want to just kind of put, put those inserts into other sets and just, just to try to bump up other sets. We decided it was time to make Metal Universe Hockey its own thing, and uh, and we've done that. And as I said, our design team has done a great job, and uh, I, I'm super stoked about, about this set. A lot of basketball card fans I know are definitely familiar with a lot of the old inserts that went into Metal Universe and whatnot. Um, you know, we, we've taken some of those, and we've created some new ones also, and it just looks awesome. So uh, you heard it first at the expo. Now you're hearing it now, but it, it is true. Metal Universe is, uh, is on its way in 2020-21. That is so cool. Is there any rough timeline for that? or um, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever it comes out, I'm sure it'll be gorgeous. Like those cards are fantastic. So I think, um, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but I know a lot of people are going to be super stoked about that product wow like like i did not see that coming personally but that is that's phenomenal i think that's going to be a fantastic product yeah it's um like i said you know we we've taken a we've taken a lot of what people like about the basketball set and we've created a hockey version of it and we we we've created some great inserts we've recreated some inserts but we are paying homage to that those original metal universe sets which people remember and will love we're not just coming out with like a a crazy new design and concept and this is metal universe you know 2021 you know we're we're paying homage to to the past 
but we're also, uh, we've also done some really nice things to add some great content to it also. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I could use up the rest of your time just talking about it, but I'm not sure how much uh, you guys want to hear me talk. <laughs> whatever you want to share about it, we're, we're down for whatever. <laughs> there'll, be, uh, there'll be solicitation out on it soon. You guys will kind of see what, uh, what I'm talking about. You'll see the old, you'll see the new, and uh, I, I, I wouldn't sit on it. I, I, I have a good sensor on products. I would not sit on this one. I would not sit and wait and see, well, let's just see what it comes out and then maybe I'll buy a box. By the time you do that, I have a feeling you're already paying more than what you would have paid before it came out. It's going to be one of those kind of products. I, I don't think it's going to be ridiculous. It's not going to like quadruple in value. Or, or, well, I, w I would love it to do that, but um, it's, it's definitely one of those products that if you don't get it on that first try, you're probably going to be paying more the second time for sure. The PMGs, it's, we're, we're doing it the old school way. Cards 1 through 10 are green. Cards 11 through uh, 100 are, are red. And then there might be some Easter eggs in there for you too. Very nice. Very cool. Well, that'll be awesome to keep an eye on um, you know, as the time gets closer for that. And that's definitely exciting news for hockey card collectors, especially those that you know, have enjoyed those cards in the past and you know, any crossover basketball collectors as well. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. And thank you so much for coming on to talk about Upper Deck One. We always appreciate having you on and, and are grateful for your time. So thanks so much, Billy. No problem, guys. Thanks again. Um, and now for the, of course, the interactive questions of the podcast for this episode. Um, we just want to know, I mean, I, I know there's a lot going on in the hobby about um, Upper Deck Series 1 this year, but we definitely want to hear from you. We've heard from quite a few of you already on Twitter, on Instagram, but we just definitely want to hear your thoughts about the new Series 1. Uh, what do you like or dislike about the product? Um, have you opened any yourself? Do you have that firsthand experience with the product or anything that you might try in the future like maybe a blaster or a tin or you know a hobby box you know there's there's plenty of options uh, this year especially going into the holiday for a lot of you guys so uh, we're going to post these questions of course um, on all our social media channels on instagram on twitter just definitely give you give us a follow on that uh, we post a lot of unique content uh, on the various platforms definitely uh, make sure to follow us there um, at the center ice card cast yeah and be sure to let us know also if you happen to pull one of the left from your Young Gun high glosses and had quite the payday. So if any of you oh, yeah. happen to be that lucky, let us know. <laughs> but um, what are you gonna do with like ten grand or something like that? There's been a couple yeah. bounties. Uh, like I think a shop was 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 willing to pay someone. I saw this this kind of old school looking bounty photo of one. Someone was gonna pay um, ten grand for the Lafreniere high gloss young gun. We've, we posted one, the first one that, that we saw surface, the five of 10, we posted a picture of that on our social media channels. So definitely, um, you know, check that out for sure. They're beautiful looking cards. Um, I really love the young guns this year, but um, yeah, just some phenomenal, phenomenal cards. So definitely let us know about that. And, and just, um, you know, of course you've heard Billy's thoughts, but um, yes, yeah, so, uh, def definitely a different year but one that I feel that Upper Deck did a, a very good job on um, with all things considered. Absolutely. So that'll wrap things up for episode 20. It's kind of hard to believe that we already have 20 episodes. 20 episodes. I, I think I was checking the numbers today. I think we have about, in total, about 25,000 listens so far. So definitely, guys, if you're out there listening, uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, your support for this podcast does not go unnoticed. Uh, you know, the whole thing for starting this uh, podcast um, was just because we knew that sports cards are seeing a jump lately. And of course, hobby is, I think, undervalued in that. So we felt it was a great time to definitely um, get the word out about, you know, hockey cards in, you know, the sports cards industry. And of course, we love talking about cards. So definitely, um, you know, we feel like just as collectors, this was something that we wanted to see. So why not, you know, create it ourselves? So we definitely appreciate the support um, on each and every one of the episodes that we produce. Absolutely. So like Aaron mentioned a little while ago, but just to reiterate, please be sure to follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Center Ice Cardcast and on Twitter at Center Ice CC. Please also be sure to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice to make sure you never miss a future episode. Until next time on Center Ice Cardcast, keep collecting those hockey cards. Thank you.